are very, very honored to have Elaine Lin with us. This is the, the first part, the first exhibit, and then she's coming back in May. We are having another exhibit. Also, we just have from the printer, you know, the brochure. That way, I would be very happy if you don't mind to pass some of them around if you are interested. Okay. okay. No, it's okay. We can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know how many of you went to the talk uh, for the uh, visiting uh, lectures. Eileen uh, uh, Eileen went to a Tibet 20 years ago, and then when I conversed with her because I was interested uh, in doing something because of the series, because of the whole spirit of what we are doing, uh, I thought that would be perfect to have her. She said, oh, but that photograph are too old. I want a new work. And then she went back. She went back this past summer. Uh, and the work that we got to be exhibited, uh, May 7, is part of that work. The one that you got to be seeing here and she got to be talking to you about is her first uh, visit. But the fabulous and fantastic thing is the contrast that she has been able to make. Uh, to me, Elaine is a fascinating human being. I have the pleasure to know her for many years in the photography circles. Elaine, besides being a very well accomplished and exhibited photographer, is a physician. Uh, she is also a practicing physician. Uh, she is also a, an accomplished musician, a cellist. <laughs> and she is, she has, if you look at her biography, she has been everywhere. And anywhere that anybody tell her that is something interesting, she's there. You come in next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she invited me to go to Tibet, but uh, you know, you had I better could. Offers. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I, yeah, I was doing another another gig. Anyway, uh, uh, it is my pleasure. It is really my pleasure to have Elaine, and we got to be. This is a conversation. Therefore, feel free. She's ready to dialogue, to tell you a little bit, and converse. This is what a gallery talk is all about. Yeah, you talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, there you are. Uh, we can do, um, start this way. Okay, over here. I, I, um, basically, 20 years ago... Well, can you I, hear her? Okay. Mm -hmm. I was working in a hospital in Nepal, and I was given this uh, clinic, the women's clinic. So every morning I would see all these women in my clinic, and they were Tibetan refugees. And uh, they all were dressed in their Tibetan clothing with their jewelry, and they were telling me about their troubles, their families. So I got very interested in them, and they invited me to their homes, which I started to find out more about them. And this is how I was interested to see, you know, where they come from and everything. So I went to Tibet, and this is the most famous a uh, temple in the middle of old Lhasa is called Jokhan Temple. And this temple is so holy that everybody walks around it clockwise all day long. They walk around and they pray. Now this is called prostrating. They stand up and they do this and they go on the floor and they get up and do it over and over again. And the women are very shy. You can see that they tie something around their skirt. You can come up and see. So when they bend over, they don't have, you know, their bum sticking out or something like that. So everybody is here to bow down and prostrate. So this is what this temple is all about. And um, there are going to be a many of these portraits around. And what happens is I go to the market every day. That's the pastime. And you talk to everybody. And then the next morning, to my surprise, I come downstairs and there's always somebody waiting for me at the front door Say, I'm going to take you somewhere today because they saw me the day before. So it was nothing official and I have all these people that took me around to, to things every day. So it was really cool. Um, you, you say everybody walk clockwise. Clockwise, never, never, come, never the other no, way that's around. that's unlucky. Why? Oh, oh, oh. It's a Buddhist thing. Oh, okay. Clockwise. <laughs> always. <laughs> It is. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you have any questions, please ask me. This is going to be just, you know, I'm just going to talk about the pictures. And How this do you is decide a, to choose to print in black and white or in color? Pardon? How do you decide to print in black and white or in color? Like what well, the photograph makes you choose which... Well, I was, I was basically, well, you see, 20 years ago, I had this little camera, and I took pictures with Kodachrome 64 slides, 
and that's what the color pictures are from. And I took these slides and I scanned them and made these digital color chromogenic prints. But I did take black and white pictures, uh, so this is why there's a combination. It was hard to come up with so many pictures from, from those old negatives and slides, but I, I really struggled. <laughs> and these two pictures were taken from, you know, I was above them in the market square. I was watching them from my balcony and people walking by. There are many sects in Buddhism. There are the red hat, the yellow hat, and you know, they, all have a, they all have yeah. a different, um, kind of, you know, they have a different belief, the color of the color of hats. So these are the yellow hats, and, and I happen to see them coming together at this meeting. So if you really want to look into it, you can Google red, red hats, yellow hat Buddhism, and you'll find a lot of hats that are different. See the people are so friendly, like despite the fact that they have their refugees and they have their poor, they seem to have this wonderful, you know, happiness inside of them that they share with you. Of course, this is because they have no diapers. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, again, the people walking around the temple clockwise, and of course, this woman decided to bring her, her, her goat with her. So if there's no questions, we're going upstairs, okay? Any questions from this floor here? No, we got three more floors to go. <laughs> okay, should we go up? Uh, which way should we go up? Uh, either way, when you want to start down there. Yeah, yeah. That way. can hear you. Uh. What can we do? Okay. okay. Come along here? Yeah, come along that way. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> this is fun. Where do you guys all come from? <laughs> <laughs> all over the high, right? What, what courses are you in? You! <laughs> 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 Social studies and elementary education. Oh, wow. This That's really great, neat. yeah. That's great. I've met people from the business course, and I've met people from... <laughs> Uh, what is it, arts and science, and, yeah. So these are all symbols of Buddhism. Of course, the, the, the prayer symbols, if you go into the temple, you hear them blow the horns and, and ring the symbols. And this is a skull of, of a yak now. The yak is a very sacred animal to them because the yak gives them their food, it gives them their fur, it gives them their butter, it gives them the labor, it carries them, and and it gives them their friendship. So um, they would put scriptures on the skulls. And this is called the karta. It's a white scarf that blesses you, gives you good health. And everybody goes around when they want to pay tribute to something, they would put a, a karta around. So um, I bought one and, and was able to give Ricardo one. <laughs> Thank you, that was great. So um, anyway, it just says, uh, so you will see many, many skulls and actually antlers that would have scriptures on them. And in fact, they put scriptures on everything. They can find rocks and everything. And of course, this is a picture that was put on the poster that you have on the inside. Right on the inside, yeah. This young man, if only he knew. <laughs> anyway, they, you know, I, the prostrating is a, something that they do from, 
they, they would start with their hands up here to the God, to the God and the deities and to life, and then they would put themselves down on the floor. They get up and they do it again and again. And um, there are people that come from faraway villages that have come two years to on their way to Lhasa to prostrate around the Yakin Temple. And you see them on the highway sometimes, beside the trucks, prostrating. And they, some of the people are going to India to see the Dalai Lama. And I passed a pilgrim, and he said he was on the road for five years. He's going to give himself five years to get to India, prostrating. And, and that is to them is their inner journey and very hard physical journey too. And they have a, a bruise on their forehead, and you know just, and that's this is the prostrating. Does, uh, does each family send one of their sons to become a monk? Yes, they used to do that, yes. Every family would send a monk, have a monk. So the monk thing is very family orientated. You know, of course, the mother would come to the monastery, visit her son, mm. and the son, like guys, would go home for weekends, you know, kind of thing. So the it's, it's yeah, it's kind of, and they get to learn to read, and they get education. So, so being, um, a monk isn't like what you, you think you you know sequestered in a monastery and you don't see li life because they get to go home play with their sister and brothers and everything. And this is the holy books. Now the books look different in Tibet. <coughs> they have uh, they put them between two pieces of wood with pieces of uh, parchment that's with the scripture in it, and then they wrap it up in material. And this is the ends of the books that you see when they put it in the bookshelf. So this is the library, <laughs> you know, the stacks. <laughs> you can study. <laughs> so this is the this is the market now. Um, in Shigatsi, which we'll see the whole village up there with the montage, there's a big market. And uh, the market will sell things that you wouldn't know what to do with if you decide to buy anything. This is like a dried um, dog's head. And it has some additional value, I hope. <laughs> um, and then this one is dry snakes. You know, oh. So um, you've got to be careful when you go shopping. <laughs> And of course, 20 years ago, uh, times were different, and you were able to see snow leopard skins. You know, you would see a man come down the mountain, he'll be carrying like three or four snow leopard skins that you can actually buy. Of course, there was major criticism. I mean, a lot of Tibetan people in the old days, they wore leopard skin around their bodies, and they were criticized severely by, you know, the wildlife people and they one time they decided to show goodwill and they burned all their pelts and uh, but at that time you could actually go and buy something like that you know it was amazing now I have a book about Tibet you can look at later It's made by a monk who has spent 30 years being a monk and photographing mm -hmm. and he does have some pictures of people wearing you know the leper skin so and this is just a picture of their how they decorate all their things and of course, this is, come along and see the yak butter. <laughs> so the yak butter has a very, very strong smell. And it's um, something that they really love to eat. And uh, something that you will probably never want to eat. <laughs> and they make tea. They make tea and they put the yak butter in the tea. And they put salt in the tea. So you get a cup of tea. It looks like a cup of tea with milk and sugar, but you take one sip and you go, ah! <laughs> it has yak butter and it has salt in it. And uh, you could try and do that and see what you think of it. And sometimes if you go to visit the Tibetan monastery or you know, even a modern temple, they would have this tea. But what they store the yak butter in is the stomach of the yak so that it will preserve the real taste, you know, won't lose the taste. So I, of course, was fascinated by these and took their pictures. So you can have a look at the, the lining and the yeah. wrapping. The stomach. The it's stomach dry. of the, yeah. Mm. It's, it's yeah, totally eventually dry. it gets dry, yeah. Mm. It's yummy. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you want to go?
Thank you. ago when I got there everybody asked me for a picture of the Dalai Lama they all go Dalai Lama picture Dalai Lama picture and I didn't have any because I thought it was illegal to do that so I took my lonely planet to the Xerox and and Xerox these uh, Dalai Lama pictures and I was giving them out but of course they go ooh, no color <laughs> so they were <laughs> so critical of them but this man accepted one of my little Xerox pictures and he held it up and now the Dalai Lama picture is illegal. If you are caught giving it out, you get arrested. So everybody that has Dalai Lama pictures, they hide it in their house. So when you go to visit, the first thing they want to show you is where they hit the picture. So, <laughs> so they said, come, 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 and behind the rice bin and beside the oil, you know, is hidden the picture. So everybody has a picture of the Dalai Lama, but it's hidden away. Uh, so that's uh, where I took that picture. And with, if you came to my talk, the very first picture around arrival was the Buddha. I don't know how many people were at my slideshow. And, and at that time, when I was there last year, it was, a, it was dry. There was no water. And there was a monk trying to throw his carta up as high as he could for, in, to, for the monk. But 20 years ago, I was there, I guess, early in the year when it was rainy. And, and there's a pool of water there. So it changes with the seasons. Mm -hmm. And this is the Shigatsi town. It was a town of Shigatsi, which is about, you know, 300 kilometers west of Lhasa. And uh, 20 years ago, there was no transportation. What you had to do was hitchhike on a truck, these big trucks, and you hitchhike, you go there. And of course, you never know how you're gonna get back, but <laughs> this is how you travel. And you can see the fort here has been completely destroyed, and it was, uh, part of the Cultural Revolution when China incited the youth to destroy their own culture. And here you will see some loudspeakers and unbelievably, three, six o'clock in the morning, you will hear propaganda really loud. And it's at four o'clock in the afternoon, you'll hear it. And in the evening, you'll hear it all coming from these loudspeakers, the whole town. Um, that is definitely wasn't there when I was in Shigasi this time. So you can look at the details in this picture of the houses, the people, the market. What okay. were they saying? What kind of propaganda? Oh, I don't you know this about Tibet. Tibet. No, it's about China and you know the political things okay. and yeah. But it's unbelievable. It's just totally loud and invasive. So you may have all heard of prayer wheels. The prayer wheel is a wheel where the prayers are written on the wheel itself. So when you spin it, the, the prayer goes automatically in the wind and it works for you. So there, at, when you see those the pilgrim with the prayer wheel in their hand, when they're turning it like this, there is a, a piece of a big spool of paper inside with prayers written on it. So when they go like this, the prayer is automatically being said to them. So this is a big prayer wheel where people spin it, they, they grab hold of this and they spin it, and you can see it spinning here, and the prayer is automatically being said for you. Isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> and the harder you spin it, the longer your prayers will keep going. So have a look at that, it's really interesting, the two things. Mm -hmm. Turquoise seems very popular. Turquoise and coral. 
and amber. And you wonder why coral yeah, is at the coral. top of the mountain, right? And turquoise is, is a stone. So amber is, is a resin from, um, from the tree. The yellow that they wear is called amber. It's very, very difficult to buy the real thing. So if you want to buy a real piece of coral, everything looks real. Um, they say you have to test it with fire. You have to light a match or a lighter and see if it is a stone. So if it's fake and you pull out your lighter, the guy who wants to sell it to you will grab his thing and go away because <laughs> you're going to melt it. And then they say that the amber, because it's a resin from a tree, it has a particular smell. So in the book, they say, rub it on your palm and smell it. Well, these people, like, okay, Tibetans only wash three times in their life. They wash when they're born, when they get married, and when they die. So they rub this on their hand, and they put their head in your face, and you go, uh oh, <laughs> there's no way you can tell what's real. So. I was hiking and trekking, and I, I bought some um, jewels from a monk, okay, a monk. And I was wearing it very proudly, and I walked into the next village. And somebody points to me, go, ah, plastic. I go, what do you mean? <laughs> I bought this from a monk. And he says, plastic. So anyway, it was fake. And uh, so on my way back, I looked for that monk. And I said, look, I said, you're a monk, and you sold me the fake things. And he go, oh, and I sold it to you. It was real. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, well, if you're not happy, pick another one. I said, well, the other one is fake, too. <laughs> so anyway, it's really hard to buy a real piece of coral and amber. But if you like it, you know, you can just, just buy it. <laughs> anyway. Um, and there are many Buddhas with many heads and many arms, and that means they have many heads to understand your problem, to give you compassion. So the more arms and more heads, more compassionate the Buddha is. So don't be scared, okay? <laughs> hey, my God! <laughs> Who are you? Who am I? How's it going? How's it going? Did you just start up here? No, I'm finishing. You're done. <laughs> I'm very He's a real photographer, this man. We are. <laughs> you didn't tell me you were coming. I would have studied. <laughs> you always turn up. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, that is so sweet. I live close. Huh? I'm, I live pretty close. You live pretty close? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to introduce you when I finish the story, so... Um, <laughs> I don't know, how, how many people were at my slideshow? Did you see the market shots of the, the, the skeletons? Anyway, I'll tell you, um, when they butcher a sheep, they take all the meat off, and then the skeleton, they would sit them up, and, the, and they would dry that way, and people would buy the skeleton, the people that don't have enough money to buy the, the meat. Look at this man. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would peel the, the muscle and the tendons off the bone and they would eat it like all day. And this woman, she's actually too poor to buy the standing up one. And you see she's carrying the bones and that's her food. They're so poor. He, she would tear the little muscles of that bone and that's what she would eat. Um, doing good. You're doing, doing good. good. <laughs> okay. Keep doing it. Gordon. Gordon here. Gordon. He's making me nervous. Yeah. Come on. We're doing good. What are you talking about? Okay. Yeah. Well, well here, uh, of course, is, is a working yak. People ride him and he's carrying all the... And, and you can see the, the landscape of, of Tibet is pretty barren. I'll come outside the building. And, and this is that prayer wheel I was telling you about that inside that you can buy these prayers. They are really tight roll of paper, looking like a tight roll of toilet paper, but it's all got prayers written on it. And they put it inside so that you can do this and the, and the prayer would be continually being said for you. So as these people circumambulate clockwise around the temple, they are doing this so the prayers are being said. <laughs> okay, come along. <laughs> okay, so how many heads does this one have? 
foreheads and arms. So anyway, what does this what does this Buddha have for you? Compassion. compassion lots of compassion. So anyway, um, and you can actually see there's a label here, the God of Compassion. It's so beautiful. And um, when I was um, this last year, I was hiking around the lake, and I was coming along a cliff, and and out of nowhere, these monks came in front of me, and I thought, where did they come from? And they just came out from, from the cliff, and I started, of course, taking their picture, and they didn't like that, so all of a sudden, they turned around and disappeared, and I thought, where did they go? And I tried to follow them and go along the cliff to see if I could find where they come from, and there were many many little houses and temples inside the, the cliffs. And this is a doorway to a small uh, a temple. And inside the monks live, they cook, and they, they do meditation and chant. So I think, um, I think we've come to the end of the pictures. Well, and I would like if you have any question for Elaine. Uh, I think that will be the right opportunity now. Uh, Tibet is a fascinating uh, yeah. land and a very mm -hmm. uh, as any other uh, old, old country, you know, I mean, very complex and very uh, yes. colorful, you know, I mean, even yeah. it's barren, as you say. Well, downstairs I have some printouts. I've been reading about the news in Tibet. I have some printouts from the China news and, and from all different newspapers. You can have a read if you like. I have copies. And I have little brochures about all the different work that I do. You can, you're welcome to take one. And you can email me questions. And also, I do have that book made by the monk that's lived there for 30 years. You can look through the color pictures and, and have an idea too, okay? How Thank difficult it is, is, how difficult is it to get in and out of Tibet? Well, you now. need a visa. Yeah. Well, now I don't know. Now it probably now won't go for a little while. Mm -hmm. But you just need a special visa, and I find that the way to get it is to book your trip through China Travel Service. If you book it through China Travel Service, it's automatic, you get your visa. But if you don't, it'd be really, really difficult to, to get in. Is it easier for you as a Canadian? Everything is easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man>. uh, <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> no, well, I think not really. I mean, we do have friendly relationships with China, but if we still have to get a visa for China, and then you get your Tibet visa on top of that. And they do not allow a single person into Tibet. You have to be at least two. So a, a group is better. They welcome groups more than they welcome individuals because you're very suspicious if you go there alone, you know. They might lose you. That's why. <laughs> See, Ricardo was coming, going to join me halfway through, and they weren't going to let him in alone. We would have to go to the airport and vouch for him before he could come in, and uh, was very That was complicated. Yeah, that was uh, yeah. Because you couldn't yeah. stay as long yeah. as I could. I couldn't stay that long, and then I said, "Well, I meet you down there." She said, "Ooh, ooh that got to be difficult." It could, you yeah. could just go one person yeah, and could, be yeah. met or something. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. you can go into China last year. You can do it through a U.S. travel agent. I don't know. I guess they do it through China, but there was no problem getting a visa at that point. No, but you were more than one person. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. No, and one yeah. person is a different. For me alone, they gave me a hard time. You know what I mean? They. Well, record it. I want to know. Very suspicious person. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm going to let this keep in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm already a monk. You know? <laughs> now, if you read about Buddhism, there's many, many different types of Buddhism, but the Tibetan Buddhism is called Tantric Buddhism. And what is so attractive about Tantric Buddhism? It has sex. So ah. <laughs> if you see a lot of the pictures, the Yap Yom is, you know, the Buddha sitting there and there's a woman who is sitting, straddling him and her head is turned in a very awkward position to be embraced and kissed. And in Tantric Buddhism, it is a blessing to have love for a woman and it's quite different from other forms of Buddhism. So if you want to read about Tantric Buddhism, it, it, it is fascinating and it's a very humane uh, Buddhism. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in. in Korea, there now, when, you, when you go, how do you know? I mean, where do you go? Do you have a guide? Do you have someone to say, oh, you should come here and meet these people or come see this? Or do you kind of just go and... Well, I, I had a guide this time. Uh, last time I didn't because there was no, there was no organized tourism. Uh, but yes, I, have, I booked a guide, a Tibetan guide and a Tibetan driver and a jeep, a four-wheel drive, and I mapped out a route where I wanted to cover the east 
the west and the north, and um, you know, also Lonely Planet, you read that. Mm -hmm. And there's another, all kinds of guidebooks that would give you an idea. But of course, as you go along, you never know what you're gonna meet. And if you have your own driver and car, you can stop anywhere as long as you want and, and, and track down any story you want to, and get stuck too, you know. <laughs> tell, tell them about when you want to eat Chinese food, what happened? Oh yes, my, well, my, this time my Tibetan guide, he's 24 years old and he is a monk for half of his life. So every temple we came to, he knew somebody and we were like, you know, he really told me all about the insides of a monastery. But every, you know, like I had a month of Tibetan food, which is yak noodle soup. <laughs> and so I would say, well, you know, there's all these Chinese restaurants. I said, can I go to a Chinese restaurant and have dinner? And He'd go, oh, no, no, we have much better Tibetan food tonight, you know, yak noodle soup. And so he would not allow me to go into a Chinese restaurant at all. Like, you know, there was just Chinese is out. And, uh, insidiously, huh? Were the monks all men? No, they got... No. They had nuns too, but I actually did not go to... I didn't find a nun. We didn't end up in one, so, yeah. But they are. They are. They, are. Yeah. they have it, yeah. yeah. So, so did you have to tell them what you were going to do, what your plan was, your route? Well, I booked, actually, I was really lucky. I went to the China service, travel service, expected the worst. And I met this man, and uh, I told him that I want to be a photographer, I don't want trouble. So I had him write me letters in Chinese to say that I have this big camera, I was really dumb, I'm an amateur, but don't even know how to get a smaller camera. And I use it for fun, I'm, it's my hobby, and I'm not a journalist. And if you see her have, using this big camera, just laugh or something like that. <laughs> so he wrote me this big long letter in Chinese. So whenever I get questioned, <laughs> you know, I hand out the letter, and uh, so they were not suspicious of me. Um, but I told him what I wanted to do, and to my surprise, he, um, he says, oh, I looked up your website, and I know what you want. <laughs> wow, this Chinese guy said that, you know, like my restoration of faith in the Chinese. <laughs> and uh, so he said, I was going to make sure your guy will work with you uh, until late at night or early in the morning, because I know you have to shoot at those days, and I'll make sure you get what you wanted. And he did. So, uh, But with that letter, I was very confident I could get out of any trouble, you know, if I got into it. But I didn't get into any trouble, luckily, then, anyway. What would you have gotten in trouble? Huh? What would you have gotten in trouble for? Well, I guess maybe if you took some pictures they didn't want you to take or... But it, it wasn't like that in August. I was there in August. I was pretty free to go everywhere except for the roadblocks. And, um, well, with my China Travel Service ticket, I tell them the thing. There was a little red button and it says, China Travel Service in two languages. And I thought, uh, you know, I wasn't even going to bring it. And uh, so every hour or so you get stopped at a, at a stop and the driver has to show his license, the car has to be legal and then all of a sudden the Chinese guy said our car was illegal. We were not allowed to be in this area with this car. This car is only registered for this other area. Get all your stuff out, we're taking the car. And I'm going, what? <laughs> you know? um. We're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And uh, so I'm racking my brains. They say, well, you know, we don't want you to pick up these Tibetan drivers in the middle of nowhere, and, and we don't want this, we don't want that. So I'm trying to tell them, I don't speak the language, that I, I have paid for my ticket in Toronto, and I'm, you know, this is all legal. So finally, I thought, the button. So I took out the button and said, see? The button, <laughs> you know, it's red. <laughs> and the guy looked at the button, and he goes, Okay, where you oh, go? And it was like this little button. Fabulous. It saved my whole trip. So if you ever get a red button with your trip, put it on. <laughs> it's very important to them that these sort of you know things that they value is is authentic. Yeah. So that was good. Did you tell them the story what happened to you in the monastery? The, the you know the. Oh, you know what? This morning they told me they're going to delete that from my tape. <laughs> Tell them this story. Really? Yeah, why not? You want me to? Why not? Okay, well, the highlight of my trip. <laughs> I, you know, I also photograph with a view camera, um, a big 4x5, and I put the cloth over my head to focus. So I'm in the kitchen of this monastery, and I put the cloth over my head and I'm trying to focus and all of a sudden I felt somebody hit me on the bum right and I thought 
well, it must be one of the kids, you know, playing around. And um, that's kind of nice. I've been in Tibet for a month. <laughs> so I looked around, and there was this monk. He hit me on the bum. And I, I said, you, <laughs> monk, hit me on the bum? And he looked at me, and he had this little smile, and he goes, sit. Tea. So he invited me to tea, and um, oh my so I was in the kitchen of the monastery having tea with his monk. But anyway, that was a funny story. But this this morning, uh, the media center told me they are deleting that from my talk. Okay. Fine. I think it's funny. So uh, you got to have some fun, right? The monks are really fun because there was another one that every time I put my head under the dark cloth, he keeps sticking his head under there oh. too, and I'm going, what is he doing? You know, like, every time I did it, he stuck his head in, and I guess he was uh, interested. Yeah. <laughs> Just curious, right? They're very Where curious. Where did you spend nights when you were traveling in the countryside outside of Wausau? Uh, you know, I stayed in uh, little inns. Yeah, they were all booked for me, uh, it was really nice. And one night there was a meteor shower, it was a famous meteor shower, and and we wanted to sleep on the rooftop to watch this, and he couldn't understand that at all, you know, <laughs> like, he just couldn't understand it. Anyway, it was really, really nice. Because now you can actually, as you know, you can stay in pretty comfortable places, and you can get your yak noodle soup. <laughs> <laughs> How is the weather? The weather in August for me was good, but like the rainy season ends in the middle of August, so I got into some rain and my slideshow showed that the roads were washed out. We had to rebuild roads and, and stuff like that because there was, the rain was always a big problem and then you get higher and all the two the snow is there, so you have to really time it. Maybe in June was better, I don't know. Was it before the rainy season? Well, not well, only that, you have to build roads to be able to cross the rivers. Oh, the rivers, the bridges are gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no bridges. And, and they, people, you know, I mean, in a few hours, they built a, you know, a road. I couldn't believe that, bringing rocks. You yeah, know, nothing and, stops them. Yeah, the, all of a sudden, people will appear from nowhere and carry rocks and, and make a road. And um, so, there's no big deal. <laughs> They're used to such tough terrain, you know, and they're, they're very, very tough people. Yeah. But I guess what I saw was that Tibetan Buddhism is alive and well because the young and the old are, are still all prostrating and doing that. And they, I think the Chinese are using that as a tourism thing because there are many, many tourists. And many of the tourists are Chinese. And uh, so they let all this happen, but mirrors insidiously underneath they are, you know, not giving them the jobs and not giving them the money and not giving them education and, and all that. So so anyway, that's what's happening in the news. Next time you won't get a visa to go to China. But today they, they said that, you know, you know, the Olympic thing is a big oh, deal, yeah. right? Um, I think that three, three countries says that they were not going to go to the opening ceremony. Right. And I think that's fine. I mean, the opening ceremony is where the, you know, the, the, the public view is, but, you know, I think the Olympics is, should be going on. So. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. I'll put that book out, and you can have a look downstairs.